Happy Thursday, and we are back for the second time this week with the Texas Grassroots Alliance live stream. I'm Alexander Montalvo. And uh, Neil Aquino, hello, hello world, hello, hello. All right, we are excited to be with you. We've got another slate of grassroots content that we want to share and we want to discuss. Uh, and there's also going to be one uh, article from an established media source that we're also going to want to dive into. Um, we're excited to continue with this experiment. Um, looking forward to additional grassroots organizers joining us uh, in the future. We want to remind folks we are on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube right now. We'll be looking to expand to other platforms. Be sure to follow us on these platforms, subscribe on YouTube, like our videos so that we can continue to get this spread and continue to amplify the great work that grassroots organizers in Texas are doing. That's right. Well, Neil, it looks like uh, we've got a couple of articles that we're going to start off with you. Um, do you want to go ahead and get us started? Let's see here. Yes. Um, I do. I very much do. Believe me. Um, Uh, let's see. That's live TV for you. So, all right. So we're sharing your screen that has your three articles, and the first one we're looking at is DPS does not respect local communities, and would be an active danger to Houston in the second Trump term. Right. Okay. Um, okay. So I have. I have two connected articles uh, here from my Houston Democracy Project blog um, that talk about, um, I'm sorry, the, let me go to the one I wanted first, please. Okay. So I have, um, I get it. Okay. So, hello. Hello again. We'll still we'll start again. That's live television for you. So I have two connected articles uh, in the Houston Democracy Project blog that have to do with uh, DPS, that have to do with public safety. Um, and you know, Alex, that uh, there's no public safety without democracy. Um, we should be expanding our concepts of public safety to include democracy. Don't you agree? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, democracy is supposed to be, you know, us all pin in on, in our democracy, our representation, and that representation should be prioritizing our public safety. And you're a family man and you envision a future um, for you and your family rooted in democracy. Absolutely. We really want to participate in the process, right? Absolutely. And the people of Eagle Pass, um, there's something called the Eagle Pass Business Journal. Um, and this business journal, uh, founded in 1993, and it, 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 makes, it, it looks to uh, advocate for the folks in Eagle Pass and the sister city um, across the border in Mexico. And it's been in existence since 1993. This is the first of two connected um post and the author of uh, of the editorial in the in the eagle pass uh business journal talked about the dps and texas national guard troops in shelby park in eagle pass and alex you know that shelby park is named after a confederate general did you know that You know what? I did not know that. Um, is it surprising? No. Is it disappointing? No. Yes. Right. They went to somewhere. Where should we? As where should we be properly stationed? Right. It's almost like, hey, look, there's a 
there's probably maybe there's a park next door that's named after like Abe Lincoln, and they didn't go to that one. They went to Shelby Park, right? And the people want to use Shelby Park. The people of Eagle Pass want to use Shelby Path Park, and they say we are grateful um, to the Eagle Pass Police Department and the Maverick County Sheriff's Office for protecting us um, in the park, and that is something uh, protecting us from the from all of the crazies who have come down to the border um, at Greg Abbott's behest. All of the National Guard who are inhibiting use of the park. Our beautiful and safe uh, public park has been taken away from us and turned into a military style staging area. And this is connected to um, what we've been hearing from the Trump administration, that they're going to use the National Guard to go into cities and uh, uh, red state, uh, red state National Guards into blue states and red state National Guards into blue cities within Republican voting states. And it, I have, I've read other stuff um, about the prospect someday of local police forces potentially being at odds with National Guard or with um, state police. And it's relevant here to Houston. It's relevant to the entire state. This program's about the entire state. It's relevant to Houston because Mayor Whitmire here in Houston, newly elected, wants to bring DPS into Houston to police our streets. And Alex, we don't want that. We don't want them here. Um, so that's an Eagle Pass. These folks, these aren't these aren't wild radical city folk, right? These are these are these are folks in Eagle Pass and in the and a heart one of the many excellent hearts of our state, and they want them out. And that is uh, connected to to the second post. And the second post uh, deals with, I appreciate everyone's patience here as I manipulate this stuff, that the, the DPS does not respect local communities and would be an act of danger to Houston in a second Trump term. So we, we've seen in the first post that DPS won't get out of Eagle Pass, even though the people want them there, appropriately stationed in a park named after a Confederate general, and that... Um, I see. And that DPS, um, that DPS in Uvalde couldn't help the people. DPS in Austin uh, wouldn't get out of the state, of the city, when Mayor uh, Kirk Watson asked them to. DPS would be empowered to enforce SB4. I think there's a court case, uh, a hearing of SB4 being held today that would allow. Um, a state police to stop anyone and make a any a routine traffic stop a potential deportation event. Um, so the upshot of this, somewhat chaotically presented on my part, what is that DPS is a threat to public safety. They can't handle the routine policing, as we saw in Uvalde. They are messing up use of a public park and Eagle Pass. There were repeated controversies in. Austin, um, when they wouldn't get out and there were excessive arrests of Latinos and that they are a threat to democracy um, because they are politicized by an authoritarian red state governor with close connections to Donald Trump. And so those are the two connected posts. And uh, in Eagle Pass, Uvalde, Austin, and potentially Houston, we see uh, these connections and what's your thought on that, Alex? What I think, if I'm hearing you correctly, Neil, is that we've got some real concerns about a law enforcement agency that is going to be weaponized as under the direction of a certain leader yeah. that can be against what they're actually supposed to be there for or what they're designed designed to be there, or in some instances, some may say they're doing exactly as they're designed, but it sounds like it's almost uh, exactly like the, governor's, the governor's able exactly. to use them as his own personal militia to accomplish what he wants to do to be his own muscle um, for his benefits 
and his political priorities versus actually serving the people of Texas. That's right. And um, his right, his muscle, that's a good way to put it, right? And we they liken Trump to a mafia boss, right? You got to be in the family. Uh, he's probably probably in hawk to, to foreign mafias, they suggest, uh, uh, sometimes that dictates his, his, his actions. Um, we, we, we hear all we hear about is public safety. I was reading today about continuous attacks on the Travis County elected district attorney. It sounded awfully kindred to the attacks here about, about our county judge um, and some of our Democratic judges. They, the, the, the Republican playbook is to undermine the actual elected law enforcement entities of judges and county judges doing their best as they give incredible amounts of money to local law enforcement and um, prosecutors. So they actually, in the name of preventing crime, attack public safety officers um, because they're not the right public safety officers. We give all this money to DPS, UPS, DPS. I have no problem with UPS. Um, DPS, although UPS is laying off a number of people despite huge profits, and they're blaming a locally a recently passed Teamsters uh, contract. So I do have a problem with UPS. And um, and what's really frustrating as a municipal resident here in Houston, we pay 40% of our budget to the Houston Police Department beyond all of the HISD, school board police, and, and county sheriffs, and, and, uh, and endless constables, and, and all the municipal police forces. We, we give all this money to these police forces, and yet there's a, there's a coup in open planning around us that the police are, are, aren't are worth a dime in stopping. We, we have our leaders saying they're gonna suspend the constitution. They're uh, turning the police into their private muscle, which was a great way to say it. They are elected official, Republican elected officials plot ways to undermine our elections. They talk about horrible racial things and, and attack uh, trans kids and, and talk about fantasizing as like a fetish shooting migrants, which they would get away with under a Paxton AG and a Trump Justice Department, and and we pay all this money to local police. The police unions support these plans. You never hear the, the our local police union HPOU still supports Ken Paxton. So I just want I want to draw all these things together. The the the, the politicized police, the basic incompetence of the politicized police in saving the children in Uvalde. The lack of regard they had for civilian authority in Austin, the desire by a law and order mayor Whitmire to bring them into Houston, the desire of our of Trump to use our National Guard, the use of the National Guard here to throw local people out of a park and defy federal authority, the sending of National Guards from red states, even if in token amounts, to Eagle Pass for some sort of symbolic things, the summoning of paramilitias in trucks. Um, who are funny and easy to laugh at until the day that they're not, the ones who came down to Eagle Pass. So you see these things, they're all real. You're being told out loud what's going on. They're all connected. It's tiring to connect it. It's, it's depressing. Um, and and uh, uh, what's your thought, Alan? Well, I think what gets frustrating, especially, you know, as grassroots organizers are in communities, talking to communities about these issues, trying to help inform around these things. We have all of these different elements at play, right? There's there's legitimate problems people have with their local law enforcement, with their local police because of, um, you know, some lack, you know, losing of trust because of someone getting killed by the police or someone getting arrested by the police unjustly, um, or the lack of uh, transparency around uh, certain situations. Um, and so you have this issue with local police that is, a, is an instance where we can't honestly talk about it, right? It, it gets politicized very quickly to where you'll have Republicans run in and say, well, you know, blue lives matter and all this kind of stuff. And you have people talking about, you know, changing how we're spending money on the police, putting more resources into other types of resources that can help serve the 
the community instead of always having someone with a gun show up to the door when that's not what's needed. Um, and, and so we see that open issue within communities and when we talk to communities, but I think what we get a sense as grassroots organizers is what's the solution? That's what the community wants to know. Like, what's the solution? How do, how do we move beyond this? And now we have this extra element of DPS that you're highlighting in, in your work on the Houston Democracy Project and how the governor, a local mayor, a potential president can also wield this force for real harm against certain communities and for certain political agendas um, that that once again, we need to try to figure out how to resolve. And when we talk to communities, adding on this other element, there's a sense of frustration, right? Of like, well, what, what are we gonna do? You know, there's there there's all this corruption, there's all these issues, there's all these people getting harmed. And I think, one, we need to have these conversations with community. We need to be able to have, to hear folks out, their experiences, to try to continue to, figure out how we do address these real problems and have real solutions. But I think one of the things we're trying to help convey to people is that we have to build collective power to change who's representing us. While we have policy changes we want to pursue, we have um, structural changes we want to pursue. We have, um, you know, issues and personnel that we need to, we need to change within these law enforcement agencies that if we continue to have the same elected representation that we have right now that continues to politicize and use these agencies and and use certain issues that come up for political talking points or for political points and one um and and we have to try to solve these things on multiple fronts but we need Texans to really understand how deep of an impact our elected representation is making in terms of our ability to solve these problems when we talk to community members. And, and that's just a first step. That's just one step. And it takes a lot of work to get through that first step for us to then go beyond that. Uh, so I think that's a little bit of what comes to my mind when I hear grassroots organizers, when we're in communities and we're trying to organize around some of these issues. Um, how, how is that for you, Neil? Yes, and excuse excuse me, Alex and audience, for having my head down earlier. I was looking for what I known I had seen in our Texas Grassroots Alliance Slack, um, Journeys of Resistance, um, This uh, the 18th and 19th in Eagle Park, um, the um, Frontera Texas Organizing Project. It's a campaign to repeal SB4, and end Operation uh, Lone Star and Frontier Texas Organizing Project. Have we? Do you know that? Do you know? Do you know those folks? Uh, yeah, I think we've we've gotten connected um, with these folks through the um, um, the Order Network of Human Rights. Okay, uh, is the organization. Well, I'm glad to say they are uh, active in our Texas Progressive Alliance. Uh, Texas Grassroots Alliance, Texas Progressive Alliance was the old network of bloggers years ago. Um, Texas Grassroots Alliance, and um, they're doing a series of events. Um, Eagle Pass, the 18th and 19th, Laredo on the 20th, Rio Grande Valley, 21st, 22nd, Houston, 26th, 27th, Dallas, 28th, San Antonio, 29th, San Marcos, March 1st. Um, and I don't see a website on the flyer that was shared. Um, here in our in our chat, but uh, there is a front, Frontera F R O N T E R A Texas organizing project. It's the We Will Resist campaign to mobilize Texans to repeal SB four and end Operation Lone Star. They're Texas Grassroots Alliance uh, members, um, and uh, and look them up. The We Will Resist campaign. Yeah, and I'm gonna go ahead and switch this to folks to share. Perfect. Uh, this is the flyer that. Um, that Neil is referencing uh, to repeal SB4 and in, in Operation Lone Star. Um, and, and a lot of key events that are happening. The next one is gonna be this uh, tomorrow 
and Saturday and Marfa, but then um, Sunday and Monday in Eagle Pass is going to be a huge effort. So this is a tour they're going on. And uh, the Border Network for Human Rights is a part of the Texas Grassroots Alliance. Um, and so they're doing this amazing work to help organize and collaborate with a bunch of organizations uh, to try to stop this. Uh, so this is something that you can participate in. Uh, this is definitely uh, an important effort that's happening. Perfect. And that's the strength of uh, organizers working together, being in one place, um, uh, every, and, and, and folks sharing word with one another, and then and then externally here. Absolutely. Um, so great, great topic to highlight. Um, I'm going to share an article uh, with folks uh, that comes from uh, the Lone Star Left. Um, Substack. So let me switch screens here. That's so that Michelle Davis. That. And uh, Michelle works hard. Her posts are really exhaustively detailed. Subscribe to her Substack and uh, and help her keep moving. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so one of the things that we're seeing from this aggressiveness from our, the Republican leadership in Texas um, is around the conflict that's happening within the party. And, and we're going to go a little deeper in terms of what's driving this conflict with another article. But for Lone Star Left, uh, Texas Republicans in total chaos uh, really shows, uh, highlights all the different ways that Texas Republicans are having this internal fight and this internal battle. Uh, and it really comes down between Ken Paxton, Lieutenant Governor, uh, Dan Patrick, uh, Governor Greg Abbott versus the Speaker of the House, Dade Phelan, uh, and some of the disagreements legislatively that are happening. So, you know, we've seen instances where Abbott is pursuing school vouchers, and then they blame uh, Phelan for not passing school vouchers um, because he should be able to deliver. It was uh, it was actually bipartisan. It was it was you know the majority of uh, Texas Democrats and and some Republicans and especially rural areas that continue to reject these vouchers because it's a scam. It's it's a way to try to subsidize private schools and religious schools for the wealthy versus actually helping public education. Um, but recently, all of these different uh, battles have gotten to where the Texas GOP censured Dade Phelan on, on multiple issues, five points in total, including, as mentioned, the school vouchers uh, issue. Well, wait, uh, so wait a minute. They're always saying he's drunk. Remember, every time I hear him criticized from the right, they don't have him. They don't have that up there. Uh, no, because they're probably them. Now, he's definitely has has, has shown to be inebriated in certain uh, times true? during the House uh, session. But I got to tell you, Neil, unfortunately, it looks like a lot of our legislators in the Texas House are dabbling with a little too much alcohol, which is frustrating as hell when you're seeing these horrible bills get passed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I have to admit hearing um, this, this subject, this subject of hearing these rotten Republicans makes me want to anesthetize myself with a drink too. Um, <laughs> and I, I really appreciate that Michelle's able to get into this stuff in detail because it just, it just depresses the hell out of me really. It's yeah. Rotten against rotten. Yeah, and I think that's definitely uh, when you dig into it deeper, it it, it really turns your stomach because um, through this uh, censure fight, there's a there's the video that Lone Star Left has put on their YouTube page uh, that folks can see. Um, but then the other thing that is happening within the GOP, the Texas GOP, and the Republican Party um, is this issue with just extreme the extremism that's happening uh and so there's other information uh, and articles that we can dig into uh that goes into how you know nazis have been an issue for the republicans that yeah. that is that is not being hyperbolic that is not being uh exaggerating uh, they legitimately had to take a vote earlier in this year on whether they would anybody associated with Nazis and struggle to pass it. I think they did revisit it uh, and, and they end up passing some form of 
denouncing Nazis within the party, yeah. but the fact that they've struggled so much to do that speaks volumes. One. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to know what to say um, beyond that, right? Um, uh, but the, they they have a um, they have a they have a problem with Nazis, and it's like a um, it's like a dormant disease. You know, you you. I don't know if you've, if you've read, have you ever read accounts of what Dallas, the Dallas area was like at the time of the assassination of President Kennedy and, and the fights were with, with the Birchers and sometimes they'd be Democrats. It was, you know, the, the Republican Party. But this is this virulent, uh, if, if you read, I wish I could recall the title. I bought a account of it at the Texas Book Depository once um, that was written by a Dallas journalist in the mid in the uh, mid 60s. And um but this this has always been the strain of the Republican Party or of the right since so much so much of it was in the Democratic Party in the 60s. And it's really disturbing because you thought that we had. Um, it's just it's just like refusing a vaccination, just like the measles outbreaks you're, you're reading about in Europe. They'll, they'll be here soon enough. But um, this 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 kind of stuff, this is this is just a return to Jim Crow, the nastiest of Jim Crow type beliefs. And they're trying the words and the and the people are there and they're trying to bring the policies. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's important for people to, as frustrating as these people are, I think one of the disconnects that we see within communities, because communities are having to deal with so much, you know, just to survive, right? Just to make ends meet, just to raise their families, to go about life, pursue their careers and things like that. It's tough to have uh, you know, politics on the forefront, because we also have a culture of not talking about politics that we pass down from generation to generation as a way of protecting, you know, those folks at the higher levels of, of our class. Um, but we really do want to help people start normalizing, understanding who is representing them, who is representing Texas, uh, because we get examples like Tony Tenderholt, where um, through all of this internal fighting within Republicans, you know, he wants to challenge people to duels and debates. And this is a representative out of Arlington, uh, Texas, that that really has no business being in the legislature um, mm -hmm. because of how absurd he approaches his role as a Texas legislator. Um, he is not there to serve the people to try to solve problems. He is there as a political um operative for certain faction of wealthy republicans <laughs> far right republicans and that is his only motivation so if there were a duel would you watch it if there was a duel would i watch it yeah. i it, it, it'll probably be tough in this day and age not to run across it right well, they might, um, you might lie they you might it might be pay for view like uh, like uh cameron may mayweather fight or something right they'd monetize it yeah i, I went down that they try to make a buck off of it because that's kind of what they do right so yeah. um the fact that this is the the type of representation we have in texas we have 150 <laughs> legislators in the house we have 31 in the senate mm -hmm. there's a lot of folks to keep up with um we are a state of 30 million people though so so this is this is uh as 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 large as that may seem it's important for us to know who these folks are who's serious about doing the work and who's serious about you know just pushing an agenda for a certain class of folks that, that have no care about actually serving texans yeah um so it will be interesting to see what impact it has this year in a ma major election year you know, Lone Star Left, uh, Michelle has done a great job of cataloging all of these different um, tweets that, you know, are probably done by staff members, right? Uh, and, and you know, approved by these, these elected officials. But I doubt they're on Twitter all the time typing all these up. But then, you know, you never know for sure. Um, so we're going to transition to another article that you have neil but we're going to come back to this topic of this republican chaos and kind of talk about what the source of all of this is but let, let, let's switch back to uh your next article uh really quick though before we do i do 
we want to share with folk, um, there's an opportunity for you to donate to the Texas Grassroots Alliance to support this work. Uh, we super appreciate anyone who can help support us continuing these type of collaborations and these type of opportunities to continue to develop grassroots leaders, to build relationships, to build ways of communication and collaboration. And any support that you provide will, will be hugely beneficial to the multitude of grassroots leaders that are doing work across the state. We, we need these grassroots organizers and more to be in this work for the next 10 years because that's the, that's, the, that's the scale and the scope of work that we have. Um, so every donation makes a difference. Um, so let me uh, just off. Uh, Uh, let's see here. Well, I'm not, I'm not accessing it here. Uh, that's, it's our friend Shirley Shaw's blog in New Braunfels. And uh, let's see, it's, uh, right now we're looking at a Google Chrome window that has your Houston democracy project. It looks like there is a third tab for that article for Shirley. There is. I see that. Definitely. See. Do you want to? Do you want to click on that tab to make that one active to see if that? That's what. Yes, I've been uh, unsuccessfully applying that strategy. Okay. Uh, tell you what. Let me switch to my screen. And I'll I'll share um, okay. her page here. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Excellent. So uh, mainly I, what I want to do, what I wanted to do with Shirley is um, I just wanted to sort of introduce Shirley because I want to use her content steadily as we go along. And it's, it's her blog. Um, um, Shirley is a Black Lives Matter uh, organizer. And uh, my wager is, is, is probably uh, an extensive uh, lifelong record of advocacy for women, human rights, um, uh, the community in New Braunfels. And she is consistently on our Texas Grassroots Alliance calls. And so one of, one of the things about Grassroots Alliance, um, about grassroots organizing and about autonomy um, from institutional structures is that it allows really good people to express themselves in a really impactful way. Um, and it's done here in a blog. So obviously she's taking time from her life uh, to do that at the, I, I sometimes will mention the John Cornyn Houston office protest that I'm part of in Houston, uh, where we stand for democracy in a visible way. Um, and many of the folks in this group are in their 60s and 70s. Our oldest consistent member is 82. And uh, autonomous organizing um, gives people the ability to um, meet other people, express what they're saying, and, and do so for many communities. And it's some of the initial progress, um, pr promise of the internet. Uh, the internet we were told was gonna open and expand everything. Alex and I have talked about, and many others, have talked about how all, you're strangled by algor algorithms, you're strangled by the, um, on the main social media chapters uh, of um, platforms, you're strangled by all the algorithms by Elon Musk being a right wing uh, for an agent by the financial imperatives of Facebook and all that. So um, Shirley's blog, um, the, the right to choose is a fundamental right given to man and woman at the creation of the world. And she, she consistently will talk about uh, pro-choice and women's uh, issues. And as, as we go along, we'll develop, we'll, we'll highlight some of her um, specific posts. But I wanted to highlight Shirley. I wanted to highlight um, the fact that we're in many different um, communities, not just the big areas. Wanted to highlight um, people of all ages have all sorts of super useful things to say. There is a lot of ageism in activist circles. Um, and that the internet, as frustrating as it is, um, these types of autonomous collaborations um, allow us to realize some of the potentials that we were told existed 30 years ago. And um, 
And sometimes I try to remember those hopeful things when I become cynical about the impact of um, social media. And uh, Shirley is a, um, a great hopeful advocate um, who we're going to continue to feature and who I bet we will have as a guest um, as we go along um, to, to highlight this. And so the, the grassroots organizer doesn't, uh, I think she's referenced that the Black Lives Matter and cha chapter in New Braunfels is, is small. Uh, excuse me if that's incorrect. Um, but what we want to do is give platforms to the individual as well as to the, um, the group um, or the candidate. And these things are super important. And I, I know in my corn and pro, in our corn and protest group, excuse me, um, people will tell me uh, we have one member in her 70s who's also a Democratic precinct chair. How this is, it is just it's super important to her psychological well being that she's able to physically express her anger at Trump and Abbott. And that is an aspect of, um, that's an aspect of our activism as well. Uh, the, the mental well-being of our people, the ability to express, the ability to be creative. Um, and Shirley is a perfect example of that who we'll, we'll be sharing with you in the weeks to come. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Shirley is uh, just amazing, amazing grassroots organizer who, who, when she shows up balls amongst a group of organizers, uh, sometimes can just do the heavy lifting work of, of verbalizing the emotions that everyone is feeling and how everyone is navigating this work and the benefit of sitting back for a second to hear her wisdom her work is so important and why it matters and why we don't give up and why we keep going and how she represents that grit and determination and perseverance to work towards a better and brighter future in Texas is hugely impactful. I mean, it's it's something that, um, you know, a lot of times in this work, it's it's all about the outcomes, right? It's, you know, we, we've even talked about, you know, we, we need to change this representation, but uh, while we may know the outcomes we're after and some of the goals that we have, the big question is how do we get there? And I think it's clear to us in grassroots organizing, as hard and difficult as this is, this can be with the multitude of issues we're fighting and the stories we're hearing from communities and ways that people are impacted. Uh, one of the ways that, um, in terms of the how, is having people like Shirley Shaw uh, continue to share her perspective, to share her, her wisdom, to share her insights um, and to continue to continue to the work in the ways that she can contribute. Um, I think it's so important. And this is why the building of relationships, you know, uh, the building of a network, the trust and the love that gets developed in this work towards a collective goal, towards us in a way at this is so important. You know, we're not robots, we're all human beings. We're all dealing with a lot. The headlines are, are not the greatest that we see coming through Texas, you know, instead of celebrating the next achievement or progress or the next advancement for communities and individuals and our, our society, we're continuing to fight against corruption and lies and attempts at, you know, our leaders to uh, take advantage of people uh, in, in all these various ways or to cause harm. And so I'm thankful for Shirley and the work that she does and the way she shows up. And then, and then briefly, you know, outcomes, um, it is about outcomes, but it's also about, um, I've heard you say, um, Egberto Willis, our, our TGA colleague will also say, you know, these are, these are problems with 20, 30 year, uh, solutions. And I, I frequently recoil about that because I, I could well be dead in 20 or 30 years and I don't want to live my rest of my life or people I value in this crap. Um, so it's about outcomes. Um, but then it's also about, um, you know, easing each other's path um, along the way and uh, realizing that in some respects, the outcomes aren't, aren't, aren't swiftly coming and they may expand your lifespan. 
And that's the story for a lot of people. Um, and, and so that's what, um, that's what Shirley does. And, um, and, uh, those that, that gives meaning to people's, um, people's lives, uh, knowing that the outcomes we hope for are, are, uh, long, uh, may, 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 may take a bit. Yeah, but, right. well, absolutely. Absolutely. So hugely grateful of, of Shirley's work. Uh, we're going to shift to our last article for the day, which is which is a doozy from Texas Monthly. Um, okay. Is it happy? And, well, let's see. The headline is the billionaire bully who wants to turn Texas into a Christian theocracy. Um, oh, good. good. That's uh, that's quite a headline. I think for a lot of folks uh, may make them wonder what the hell does that mean? Um, and this does a great job of breaking all of that down. And so uh, we've seen a lot of work done by, by grassroots organizers. I'm going to go back to Lone Star Left just to highlight uh, this um, and some of the work that grassroots organizers have done uh, in collaboration with Michelle's Lone Star Left. Um, Let's see. It's 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 taking me a second because there's so much great content <laughs> here That's on the right. site um, that I I probably should have searched for it instead of scrolling for it. So uh, bear bear with me here, folks. Oh. Um, but we have a, a recap of collaborations where we had several grassroots organizers work together uh, over of last year, um, and one of the key articles that were being written, one of the key themes was by Daniel Cohen um, with Indivisible Houston, where back in July, and others have created content as well, but he did a couple of different articles around the impact of Christian nationalists and, and what, what it's doing to Houston. So the state of Christian nationalists end game, colonize Houston, That's Christian right. nationalist billionaires want to take over Houston. Um, and then Michelle also contributed to oil oligarchs grip on Texas, how their influence blocked energy reform. And who else is top 10 most influential oligarchs? Um, and then how education was being used as the, the third red scare and, and wokeism and things like that. So once again, grassroots organizers are on the front end of this work. We're talking about this well in advance, uh, but we do want to give Texas Monthly uh, some some great kudos for, for their recent article of this year where, where they contributed to continue to try to summarize for people and and the folks who follow their publication around these uh, uh around tim dunn specifically and the way this west texas so they have a great uh breakdown of some of the different components that tim dunn is working through and how he is funding uh, various aspects of of their, this movement. They have within the, their article is this chart uh, that shows the cross section between education, business, religion, media, and politics. And so this is the vast network that Tim Dunn is at the center of to drive influence, funneling money to build an infrastructure and a lot of times uh, we'll talk about, Neil, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger for folks. We talk about grassroots organizing infrastructure. And a lot of, a lot of people are like, what does that mean? What does that mean, organizing infrastructure? You know, um, we just need to, to call, talk, knock on doors of voters, and it'll take care of itself. Um, but it's really about understanding the levers of influence and how we collaborate and how we work through various communities because our state is so big and this web of influence is infrastructure that tim dunn is heavily investing in as a multi-billionaire and with other billionaires and so this is what we're up against this web of influence and this infrastructure is really still at the top levels you can drill down and drill down and drill down to all the way down to certain communities, certain local leaders, certain local businesses that are all connected with this web of influence. And what we are proposing to folks saying that 
progressive grassroots organizers are in our communities fighting the good fight on the front lines and the Texas Grassroots Alliance is working to help build and contribute to this infrastructure so that we can work together to fight this. Because us working independently and in our silos will not be enough to fight this wave of influence. There's gonna be it a is- day, there's gonna be a day where all of these people they're gonna be reading their their monthly copy of Intolerance Monthly. And there's gonna be a graph of with us. Uh, uh, all of our uh, Texas Grassroots Alliance, the infrastructure of, of progressive Texas that's thwarting their dreams. The, like like they threw the copy of 1984 in the, in the burning barrel and we got it out of there. Who did that? And there's going to be, uh, there's going to be in their copy of Evil Monthly or Oligarch Monthly that they're reading. We're, we're going to get to the point where they're, they're reading about our infrastructure. Yeah. You know what? There's already been some political advertisements done in some local areas where they're trying to sketch out the web of progressive influence. Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. And frame it, frame it in the ugliest way possible to try to scare folks. I'm like, if only I were um, true. Say again? I'm like, I, re- I see that stuff. I'm like, oh, I wish that was all true. Yeah. The, the key thing is that we don't have near the amount of resources. And so so what we do see, though, is that there is an anecdote to these millions that are being funneled in by these billionaires, um, and it's community. It's building the network. It's building relationships because we've seen where they've invested $400,000 in local school board races uh-huh. um, compared to tens of thousands of dollars. And while they may win that race... They only won it by dozens or a couple of hundred of votes, you know, a couple hundred votes where all of that money barely could overcome the the community at large. And really, if the community had organizing infrastructure uh, to where we needed it, which which would not be a huge investment uh, compared to what they're investing, uh, we could continue to beat back what they're trying to do. Uh, they have to overspend because at the end of the day, a big part of their work is around propaganda and around uh, propping up um, businesses and initiatives and and organizations that um, are, are looking to try to do grassroots type work, um, but really aren't because they're not trying to build a collective with the majority. Their collective is a far right minority that they're trying to, to have as loud as possible and as impactful as possible. But the majority of Texans do not agree with their extreme views. But in order for those for that majority to show together to, to stop this power, uh, we need to have that collective power working in sync and participating in whether it's voting, definitely, but also showing up to local government, continuing to build those relationships, and that's organizing infrastructure. And that's just the big thing that we want to make sure that we're highlighting for for folks. This is a great article to get a lot of the details that were identified by grassroots organizers a year year ago and have been identified by other folks in other articles. So this is the latest recap to try to get to remind people how the, you know, Defend this Liberty Pack, you know, is coordinating with Nazis for strategy, like Nick Fuentes in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, what do they do when they get exposed? They change their name. Uh, they, they move around some people uh, so, so that it can throw people off. They're not changing their strategies. They're not changing their game plan. They're still operating. Um, the same. And so uh, we really need folks to understand that this is a fight uh, that we need to be able to resource adequately, uh, not needing nearly the same amount of funds, but we do need resources. Grassroots organizers and the autonomy that they're working within go a long way for our progress in Texas uh, by resourcing this. 
And if you ever wonder why, you get this chart and it'll tell you everything you need to know in terms of why we need to do that. So, uh, Neil, how does that make you feel looking at a breakdown of all of this money and all this influence and and how it translates to what grassroots organizers are trying to do in Texas? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's depressing. And um, with the, some of these school boards, for example, uh, a local tragedy almost here is the conservative takeover of the Cypress Fairbanks Independent School District, which is one of the 50 largest in the country. And it is much of unincorporated Harris County. And through two election cycles, right wingers took over. It's an incredibly diverse area. I worked in the area for years. It's an incredibly diverse area, um, but folks just don't vote. And they're, um, it's very fractured. Um, the, this wasn't the subject of, of the thing, but it makes me just, you know, so much, so much of our democratic votes come from multiracial suburbs. Um, but the communities aren't always united and sometimes in opposition to each other. They're new, they're new in the area. Um, terrible transportation. I worked on a main street in that area and there wasn't a single bus. Um, you know, so the, inf the social infrastructure isn't there. Um, and I, I'm just talking about this because of some of the school board, the mention of, of, of some of the school board races. And it was clear what was happening in Cypress Fairbanks. And there were organizers, there were local organizers who are heroes, um, who I would see on Twitter and have a little bit of contact with. Um, it was just a little bit outside my own bandwidth to get to get involved. Um, and, I, and, and to his credit, State Representative John Rosenthal, um, as we talk about some of these resources for grassroots organizers could come from electeds and safe districts. And John now does have a safe district because the gerrymander made his district more safe and put Republicans elsewhere. Um, and so that this was a state rep who did do some block walks and did try to funnel some resources into the side fair races. And I, one of our consistent themes is that our electeds uh, joined the fight. Our uh, resources could come um, and there's a tension there because we're saying be autonomous from, from electeds and here we're saying elected to participate. So that's, that, that's, that's a tension, but they could, uh, very easily knowing that this Cy fair race was coming, the local democratic establishment could have, and labor could have begun organizing a long way in advance and labor did do some, um, up there, but it, it was a, just, just a tragedy. There's no other way to say it, that this huge school district for with these Moms for Liberty folks and the very same networks you're talking about. Um, and there was a picture locally somewhere on Twitter or something about books. Um, books taken out of sci fair district classrooms that are just sitting in. And it was just what you'd expect. It was Maya Angelou, it was George Orlo, Orlo Orwell. Um, it's just what you pick. So these these fights have real repercussions, and um, it would be great. It would it'd be great if some of our electeds. I see we're at fifty four minutes. We're, we're we're and it'd be great if some of our electeds would help. Um, and I don't want to be the Republican Party um, at all. Um, but there you, you see the inexorable gravity of its Trump loving base, um, move the party consistently to the right and pressure their electeds to be more like them. And I, I don't want that, but you, you, you wish sometimes, and it's not even an ideological pressure. It's not, it's not like, it's not even inherently like a Hillary versus Bernie fight. It's just, it's not ideological in some respects although it's sometimes establishment versus anti-establishment, but it's just, it's action against inaction. And you wish that our democratic elected seeing so much would be less afraid of action because they see a primary challenger under every rock. Yeah. And won't, won't, not only won't they build grassroots networks, but they will actively employ influencers and, and people to disparage um activist network yeah um 
So those are some impediments to us creating the type of infrastructure detailed in the magazine. Yeah. And yeah, because it comes down to like power and money uh, at, at the end of all the day of all of this stuff. And, um, you know, not all the power and money, but we do need a little bit of the, the resources to be able to change the, the dynamics of power so that they actually serve the people. Uh, and so, so that's a big part of the work that grassroots organizers do because they operate it from an autonomous perspective. You know, party politics isn't necessarily their priority. It's something they navigate uh, to be able to try to move things forward. But they're also working in spaces like mutual aid, activism and advocacy, as well as electoral organizing. And so it's the whole it's, it's the whole ecosystem that grassroots organizers are trying to navigate. Um, and, and it's why it's important for us to get resources and to highlight the work that grassroots organizers are doing and to continue to support them. Um, but that is the end of our show for today. Um, this is our third live stream. We're going to keep experimenting, keep uh, navigating uh, our, and bringing on other folks. So excited for other organizers to join us in the weeks to come. Uh, thanks so much for spending time with us. And let's keep working. Thank you. Thank you, world. Thank you, Alex.